thank you. Does anyone else do that when they take off their mask? <sighs> it's just, just me, maybe. Right. Can you hear me okay? Zoom, can you hear me? Great. Let's get organized. <sighs> so um, if you have a Bible, um, you might want to get that ready for the talk. So yeah, my name's Jenny, and I'm talking to you this morning um, on our series, Unmute, and my little title today is Everyone Gets to Play, as you can see from the pretty PowerPoint. I thought I'd choose pretty design. There isn't much choice on PowerPoint. <laughs> so firstly, um, thank you, Kirsty, by the way, for helping me. Um, with the PowerPoint. Um, firstly, um, I want to get you to consider some questions. Um, just in your head, no need to answer them out loud. Um, so the first question on the, on the next slide up. It's a hard one, isn't it? Have you disliked or liked being on Zoom for church and missional community meetings? And be honest with yourself. Why do you think you feel like that? Okay, next question. Are you excited or nervous or a mixture of both about connecting with church and your missional... I put MCs, that's missional communities, in the flesh again. And again, why do you think you feel like that? So the second question um, is concerning what we've labelled as unmute. So our voice can be heard again in our groups and amongst the community that we're going to hopefully try and connect with and are trying to connect with at the moment. So does that notion liberate you or make you feel a bit wary? So whatever your answers are, they're completely normal. And having the self-insight to acknowledge the reason why you feel things is part of wisdom for being a human being and a Christian. I think another important quality of wisdom is having empathies for other, other people in the church and your missional communities who feel the same way as you or who might feel completely differently. And that empathy will make connecting with the community easier. So, thank you. So, bear these thoughts in mind as I transform you back over 2,000 years to a group of people with different characters, attitudes, life experience, and they were called the disciples. There they are. <laughs> they were Jesus' 12 um, top followers. He had lots of followers, but they were the 12 main followers who you could say, although they probably didn't realize it at the time, were arguably the first of Jesus' missional communities. So I've just thought I would draw out some key facts about, um, well, they had a lot going on for them, but some key facts about each one to refresh our memories um, or make you learn at all about any of the 12. I'm just going to have a drink. <laughs> so first of all, you've got um, Simon Peter. And he was the brother of Andrew. He was a fisherman. He was married. Um, he seemed quite headstrong just from what we read about him. Um, for example, he didn't want his feet washed at first by Jesus um, at the Last Supper. Uh, he couldn't understand how a savior wanted to be a servant. He didn't quite get it. He got it eventually, as we know. He denied Jesus three times at his arrest. 
But then he turned out to be the first prominent leader of the Christian church. And he's also, also the author of 1 Peter and 2 Peter in the Bible. So next him you've got um, Andrew. And that was uh, Peter's brother. He was also a fisherman. He actually started as a disciple of uh, John the Baptist. And Andrew recognized Jesus as the Messiah when he saw him. And he introduced here, Jesus to his brother, um, Peter. Next to him, in the fetching blue attire, <laughs> uh, is James. So James was um, the son of Zebedee. He left his father fishing to follow Jesus, and he was known as Big James. He was quite tall. Next to him, you've got John. He was also the son of Zebedee, and he left his father, um, who was fishing, to follow Jesus as well. And John, um, we know um, Jesus loved him like a brother, and Jesus... Um, wanted him to take care of his mother Mary um, upon his crucifixion. He's the, he's the author of the Gospel, John. He's written three epistles and he's the author of Revelation. It, a, a fact, he was the only disciple to die of natural causes in the end. Just a little fact. And he was a leader in the early church as well. And next to him, you've got Philip. Looks a bit puzzled. <laughs> he recognizes Jesus um, as the prophet that the Old Testament um, predicts that they talk about. He tells Bartholomew, also known as Nathaniel, about Jesus. And little fact, I think it seems like he had links to the Greek community because um, a group of Greek people wanted to speak to Jesus um, just uh, at the Passover as he entered Jerusalem and um, Philip introduced him. Uh, so next him you've got Bartholomew, maybe called... Da and Nathaniel as well. And Nathaniel, if that is the same person, asks Jesus when they meet, how did you know me? And Jesus says, I saw you already, Nathaniel, when you were underneath the fig tree. I knew you already. Matthew, down at the bottom. He's so, such an interesting character. Um, he's also called Levi, and he was a Jewish tax collector for the Romans. So he would not have necessarily been liked by his fellow Jews. But we know he just left his tax collector booth when Jesus said, follow me. I just got this vision of him leaping over the tax collector booth, but we, that's just in my imagination. But it's quite dramatic just to follow him. And Jesus went for a meal with him and his sinner friends, in inverted commas. And he was the author of the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, next, you've got uh, Thomas. He's also called Didymus, and that means twin. We don't know who his twin is, but that's what it means. He didn't believe that Jesus had risen, do you remember, after the um, resurrection, after the crucifixion and the resurrection, until he saw the wounds in Jesus' hands for himself. And Jesus says that amazing line, it always sends shivers, because you have seen me, you have believed, but blessed are those who believe and who have not seen me. That's us, isn't it, I suppose? And Simon the Zealot, we don't, I, I couldn't find much about him, but
but he was a previous member of the Zealot Party who were violently opposed to Roman rule. So uh, you can imagine um, maybe him and Matthew didn't quite see eye to eye when they first met each other. And Thaddeus, the nice little hat. He's also called Jude or Judah. He might be the Jude that wrote the book Jude, who might be the brother of Jesus. There's a lot of, there's lots of mites. And then you've got James, son of Alphaeus, who's known as Little James. I don't know a lot about him. And lastly, Judas, Judas Iscariot, who later on betrayed Jesus. And then upon Jesus, Judas's suicide, he was replaced later on by the disciple Matthias, bringing the total up to 12 again. And just the next slide. Thanks, Kirsty. This is a, a still, a photograph of the disciples and Jesus uh, from um, a series called The Chosen that I've been watching at the moment. It's really good, by the way. I recommend it. So it just shows them as a gang hanging out together. So um, I thought we could read together, um, if you've got your Bibles, and I'll share it on the screen. There you go. Matthew 9, 35 to 10, 4. And I've forgotten, sorry, Zoom, to look at the camera. And they, um, Rich said, look at the camera. Sorry. <laughs> Lots of places to look. So, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. He called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. And these are their names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother, Math, uh, brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus. Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. So these verses happened after the Sermon on the Mount, where uh, that was the first big teaching of um, Jesus um, giving the good news of the kingdom. And many healings um, he did as well. And before that... Um, He'd, uh, Jesus had been baptized by John. He'd been tempted in the wilderness. He'd called his disciples and began to preach and heal the sick. And this passage is also the first time that Matthew lists all 12 disciples. So I can only assume that the disciples had hung out a lot together by then on their amazing journey so far with Jesus. Could we say that they were learning how to be a missional community together? Before, under the authority of Jesus, they were sent out on mission for a time by themselves, as we read to heal people. They knew each other's rhythms, their characters, their likes, their dislikes, possibly got over their differences and accepted each other's culture mix. I mean, I can only guess this, obviously, but 
it's only natural for a group of people who hang out quite a lot to go through these stages. So do you think you've gotten to know your mission or community like this yet? I mean, I, th I think Zoom has been an amazing gift to help us connect. However, when we're physically all really allowed to be together again, we're going to see each other in 3D. And we're going to learn better each other's rhythms and much more about our characters and our habits and our likes and dislikes. So let's look at another reading which took place after the discovery of the empty tomb. Jesus had just appeared to Mary Magdalene and she had just told the disciples of that appearance. So it's John 20, verse 19 to 23. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. I wanted just to look at um, a few, few bits from that. Verse 21, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. So how did the Father send him? Well, in John 3, 16, it says, God sent his own one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn it, but to save it through belief in him. In the Gospels, Jesus' mission was a really dominant theme. And his mission, he says, is our mission. So how do we go on mission? Well, with Jesus through the Holy Spirit. I want to talk about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our helper. The Holy Spirit will drive us and inspire us if we give it the steering wheel and we let it and we trust it to operate as God wants us to. In verse 22, it says, Receive the Holy Spirit. He blew or breathed on them. I found out that the Greek word, um, oh, I'm going to pronounce this wrong, septuagint, they're probably thinking, that's awful, Jen. Um, but it's the same word that was used in Genesis 2-7 for how God breathed into Adam's nostrils, giving him the breath of life. The beginning of Adam's life and relationship with God was activated by the Holy Spirit being breathed into him. And the beginning of the new life for the disciples was activated by the Holy Spirit, being breathed into them by Jesus. And the beginning of our new life with Jesus, whenever that happened for you, was receiving the Holy Spirit. So don't underestimate the Holy Spirit. It is our helper and our power source. Jesus commissioned the disciples in the same, and us in the same way. He tells the mission, 
sending us out to make disciples of all nations. And then he gives them and us his helper, the Holy Spirit, to help us carry out that mission. Just like in the disciple, just like in the verse where every disciple was asked to go on mission, every member of the church can join in on mission. With the Holy Spirit, you can do amazing things. Someone told me a story earlier about how the Holy Spirit had worked in their life, and it was just, it's amazing. That's the only word you can use. So Richard and Catherine, um, as we know, have had that prophetic message that the best way to do this at St. Michael's is via missional communities. So I thought we'd just understand or refresh our memories about what uh, missional communities are. That's the, thank you, Kirsty. So this is taken from our church website. We believe God wants church to operate as family and he invites his family on his mission to share the news with everyone in Twerton that Jesus changes lives. We encourage everyone to join a smaller family on mission that we call missional communities. And these communities each have a different focus to reach a specific pocket of people. And the next one. So uh, currently we have um, the following missional communities. There can be loads more. Roots, you can read uh, what it says. Roots, um, exploring the roots of Christianity. Twerton Central, loving local Twerton residents. And families, modeling kingdom family. So just like the group of disciples, a missional community is a group of people who are individuals, who have their own stories and cultural background, and commissioned to go out on mission by Jesus, who ultimately grow in number. Every member of each MC, I'm calling them, is valuable just as you are in God's eyes and has you all have different divine gifts. The missional communities, I thought, emulate the church, which is the body of Christ. Um, if you remember in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, each one of part of that body of Christ has an important part to play. And God has arranged us and that those parts in exactly the way he wants them. One body, each with a part to play. Diverse, yet unified. On different stages of our life journey, on different stages of our spiritual journey. Differing personalities and coping strategies but we're all unified in Jesus, Jesus-centered, with equal concern for each other. So um, while preparing for this, I asked each missional community from a leader um, to feed back how you're all feeling, how we're all feeling. And the feeling echoes the wider world, really. We're bruised by the pandemic. We'll all heal at different rates, won't we? And we may be scared to go out on mission. But actually, some of us are just so keen to go out and reconnect with people again. Making up for lost time. So think about your own mission or community. What does that look like for you? So looking at the group of disciples, they all had different characters, flaws, abilities. But Jesus used them and wanted all of them to be on mission with him and on into the future. 
they seem to display as we read their stories in the Gospels, insecurities, shame and distrust at various stages, while actually hanging out with Jesus. But each of them glorified God in the end, in their faithful commitment, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, to ultimately share the gospel with the rest of the world. Without them, I don't think we'd know. While I was researching this and preparing the sermon, I received a, a really encouraging word from God for you and me. He just said, you can go out on mission and witness. You're already doing it. The next slide. In Matthew 5, 14. Your lives light up the world. You are a reflection of Jesus, the light of the world. Don't hide your light. Let it shine brightly before others. So that the commendable things you do will shine as a light before them. And then they'll know your father also. You see that your lives light up the world. That's present tense. You're different in a really good way. (laughs) If you're living your life with Jesus as your power source, you are already showing others around you. So just have confidence to go further so that more and more people might be introduced to him. And ask the Holy Spirit to enable you Join in on Jesus' mission to bring the world back to God, to bring the kingdom. And um, I think this is a really important point, that even in our brokenness and suffering, we all have value and worth, and we are discipling. I I love the verse um, in 2 Corinthians 1.4. He, God, comes alongside us to comfort us in every suffering so that we can come alongside those who are in any painful trial. We can bring them this same comfort that God has poured out upon us. And there's that empathy I spoke about at the very beginning. So um, something practical um, to try um, in your missional community. And we've started doing this a little bit in the family's missional community. Uh, It's practice telling your story to each other. The story of you and Jesus. This is, um, I find, a really good way also to get to know each other and to get to know yourself. Next slide. So I just can't help but be really passionate and just encourage you. Remember, you have worth. You are so precious. And your story is so worth telling. He, God is so happy that you are his and you recognize him and believe him and have turned towards him, leaving your old ways behind. So wherever we are on our journeys with God, whoever we are, the Holy Spirit can power us to do extraordinary things. So I'm just going to finish on a thought. Can you remember how it felt before you knew Jesus? Do you think your life was muted? Now, I just don't think we can imagine life without him in it, driving our life. Can't come unstuck from him. (laughs) And just think, God wants that so much for the rest of the world. He invites you to help him reap the harvest. In a tailor-made mission that suits you, that fits your gifts and character that he's given you. To be his kingdom curators and caretakers again. Amen.
So I think we're going to have time of um, prayer and just asking for the Holy Spirit to come and be with us, come and be with you, and ask it what you what, what you think God wants you to do and ask the Holy Spirit to give you that power and that confidence to do that. Thank you, Jenny. Um,